lot to think about there. Uh, Saul, please. If Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, my remarks in presenting the BEPS Monitoring Group uh, submission uh, will build, I think, on much of the discussion this morning. I don't know, have you got my slide? I can't follow them. I can't follow them off my own thoughts if I don't have my slide. Thank you very much. Uh, starting really with Will Morris's challenge. Uh, I think it was clear from uh, much of the discussion, but Will set the tone that we are in a period of change. Change is going to happen, but we need to know the direction. And it does seem to me we are at a turning point. We need to be planning, really. A, a few commentators this morning said at least five or ten years. I would say the challenge is we need to plan, really, for the next 80 years. When we've now lived with rules designed 80 years ago, and we really have to think substantially far ahead into the future. Uh, we shouldn't be dazzled by uh, the current changes, which are very substantial. Um, so we need uh, a clear direction of travel. So what we're proposing, next slide, um, <coughs> is a combination of principles and pragmatism. Sorry, thank you very much. <coughs> Look, first, you need to establish the direction of travel through clarifying the principles. And the starting point, it seems to uh, me, and I think that was put forward by a number of commentators this morning, is to clearly adopt this, a single enterprise principle. The current rules are bedeviled by the ambiguity. Uh, a lot of people talk about independent entity. Uh, and this seems to be a mistaken starting point. Uh, it, it does create, as a few commentators said this morning, the perverse incentives uh, of uh, uh, allocating or devising structures using independent entities in different jurisdictions. But more fundamentally, if the purpose of the international tax rules is to ensure there's neither a double taxation nor double non-taxation, that needs to look at multinational enterprises as single entities. Uh, double taxation uh, doesn't occur on an independent entity basis. You can have different tax authorities taxing different related companies, and that's not double taxation. It's only double taxation if you bring it into the optic of the enterprise as a whole. So even the principle of double tax, of avoiding double taxation, requires looking at the multinational enterprise as a whole. But double non-taxation even more so. Um, and I think that runs through. It runs through the BEPS project. Uh, the mandate from the G20 leaders was to ensure that multinational enterprises are taxed where activities take place and value is created. That needs looking at the enterprise as a whole. So in terms of a direction of travel, we need that. Companies themselves do that. They're primarily accountable to shareholders and other lenders. And that doesn't mean that each independent entity borrows independently. They have consolidated accounts. They have uh, shares, which are shares in the ultimate owning entity. Uh, even if it's listed on several stock exchanges, it's not the shares of all the independent entities uh, or the accounts of the independent entities that investors look at. So if multinational enterprises present consolidated accounts to their uh, shareholders, tax authorities need to look at multinational enterprises as a consolidated entity, single entity. So that must be the direction of travel, the first direction of travel. Secondly, if we are moving, and I think we are, towards an allocation approach and away from the transactional approach uh, that's been, uh, I think, bedeviling international transfer pricing rules for the last probably 25 years since the 1995 guidelines, what are the principles? People say, what are the value drivers? And again, I think we have to pitch it at the level of the generic principles, look beyond the current business models. And at a fundamental basis, when you talk about profit generation, we suggest that there are three factors that generate profit. First is people, labor. A number of the corporate contributions this morning stressed it's our people that create value. <coughs> Secondly, capital. Clearly, there is investment. Uh, uh, <coughs> And thirdly, there are sales. Now, why sales? Because they're essential to realization of profit. Uh, so I think the, the idea of what general creates value, uh, sure, uh, uh, innovation, ideas, uh, new methods of doing things, but unless you can sell, you don't realize the profit. So if we're taxing profits, we're suggesting those are the three underlying general principles for creation of value. <coughs> now, then why are they important in terms of sele selection of these allocation factors? As I say, the generic factors 
allow for change. They allow for adaptability, uh, and they allow a bottom-up approach to actually concretizing that. So although that should be the direction of travel, I'm not saying we should leave it at that. Uh, what we're suggesting is a bottom-up approach to quantifying that for particular business models, particular industry sectors. <coughs> uh, secondly, as I think some of the contributions to the uh, discussion draft pointed out, uh, that these are a balance of supply and demand factors, production and consumption factors. A balanced approach uh, is a principled approach. Uh, and thirdly, very importantly, in considering the allocation factors, you do need to look at the impact on, in, on investment as much as on tax revenues. It's easy to say, uh, you know, there'll be winners and losers. Winners and losers in what? We don't necessarily win if we win a lot of uh, uh, tax base uh, unless we actually win investment. So in that, that respect, I, I agree with a lot of the comments made this morning. For example, my friend Jesper saying, what's the impact on uh, investment? It's very crucial, and uh, uh, a balance of factors ensures that. If you shift too much towards uh, uh, the production factor, you may, uh, uh, labor-intensive countries that are labor-intensive may gain uh, revenue share, uh, but at the cost of probably diversion of investment in, in actual activities. So that's why I think a, a balance of apportionment factors in terms of principles is important, but equally important uh, is the need to develop, and this is where the pragmatism comes in, that we don't at all stop at that. I, th I would uh, hope uh, that the inclusive framework can set a clear direction of travel, but that is only a starting point for a lot of detailed pragmatic work uh, to develop uh, uh, how you concretize that. Uh, and that's why I'm moving to, to really the mechanisms for implementation. <coughs> uh, how do we then uh, create certainty and predictability for business and simplicity and uh, ease of administration, which is all factors rightly stressed, I think, this morning. Uh, firstly, the uh, uh, way of quantifying the factors uh, must be based on physical factors which reflect actual activities in each country. Uh, they must be quantifiable, easy to apply, and therefore hard to game. Game, uh, it, not in the sense that they won't affect business investment decisions. Clearly, they will. But there will be real investment decisions. Uh, there will be investment. Uh, there will be decisions on where to actually locate people, physical assets, and as Paul rightly said, cons consumers, customers tend to be fairly immobile. Uh, but for me, I, I, I don't mind it. If a, if a business wants to actually relocate a big group of its people to another jurisdiction, th th for me, that's not gaming. That's a legitimate incentive. Uh, for companies to decide where to locate real activities. The problem with gaming uh, is where there are uh, really fictitious profits allocated. <coughs> uh, so looking at these factors then, how, do you, how would you quantify these factors uh, according to these principles of quantifiability and ease of application? As I say, first it needs to be, uh, the capital factor needs to be fixed and tangible assets. Now people say, what about intangibles? It's clear already from the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, as revised in the BEPS project, um, that mere ownership of an intangible uh, is not a factor. The ownership can be located anywhere. It's notional. The transfer pricing guidelines already set, say that it's uh, the practical aspects, and in particular, uh, the DEMPI factors. <coughs> and I'll say more about that, but that, I think, moves intangibles, really, to the labor factor rather than the capital factor because the mere abstract value of an intangible I don't think should be an apportionment factor. <coughs> but within uh, these, uh, this tripartite uh, set of principles, I think we can then have a debate uh, about which factors can be subsumed into that. And in the discussion draft, uh, many people have said uh, user base is important, but it shouldn't be the only thing. Marketing tangibles are important, it shouldn't be the only thing. All of those, we need to look at what it, the generality is that lies behind those proposals. Now, as I say, user contributions are important. I think there are different aspects of user contributions. Uh, my own view is, and I think our, our, our collect, we've had a discussion within our group, and we've come to the view, I think, that primarily user users should be, or user base, should be considered a capital asset. Many uh, digitalized businesses do invest a lot in building up a user base uh, in a period in which they're not generating very much in the way of revenues. Uh, and I think there is a debate now within uh, 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 digital uh, circles 
uh, about users. Are users unpaid labor uh, or are they assets? Uh, on the whole, from a tax point of view, I would suggest uh, they should be treated as, as assets. Uh, but that could be for debate. That could be to, to discuss, agree, and then add quantities to it. How would you then quantify a user base? Uh, there are ways in which that could be done. Uh, but as I say, I would uh, treat them as uh, a user assets. Also partly because if you treat them as uh, labor, then you get to either the labor factor or the sales factor. Um, under the labor factor, as I say, that's where uh, for us, uh, the uh, intangibles come in because, as I say, already the transfer pricing guidelines stress that what's important in intangibles are the DEMPI functions, which is based on the significant people factors. DEMPI functions are carried out by people. So the remuneration costs of uh, development, uh, enhancement, maintenance, protection, uh, and uh, what, I forget the last one. Uh, uh, <coughs> Those factors are people factors, essentially, and how much you pay at every stage, how much you pay the people who perform those actual activities in relation to intangibles uh, is, to us, a good way of quantifying the importance of intangibles. <coughs> and then finally, sales. Uh, and I think part of the discussion, and Paul's comments are very apt, I think, but part of the discussion about it marketing intangibles is, is, is kind of dual there because uh, the value of marketing intangibles is reflected to some extent in sales. That's fine. Um, so if you have a sales factor, that reflects some aspects of marketing intangibles. On the other hand, there often is uh, a, an, an investment in people who work on uh, uh, the design of, uh, uh, of uh, logos uh, and uh, uh, other marketing intangibles. Uh, some companies have hundreds of, uh, of people working in uh, business outreach, maintaining customer lists and so on. Uh, so that's reflected in the people factors. Uh, so rather than look at specific issues, I mean, what I would plead for now is that we do need a principled approach that goes to quantifiable factors. A big danger is that if we don't have sufficient agreement on the way forward, that we end up with another 100 or 150 pages in the transfer pricing guidelines where you have a, another chapter or a section about how you might do a, 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 a functional analysis of marketing intangibles and so on. I mean, already the transfer pricing guidelines, I think, have become largely dysfunctional, and I, I really hope we don't go in that direction. <coughs> Finally, on, the, on other aspects of the mechanics, obviously a key issue is compatibility with the existing rules, and we should start from the treaties, the text of the tax treaties, which I think is often uh, misunderstood. Uh, in particular, uh, the uh, articles in the tax treaties on allocation of profit, which is what we're really talking about now, um, <coughs> have an ambivalence in that the purpose of Article 9 is to allow adjustment of the accounts of related entities, recognizing that related entities are part of a corporate group. Yet, they establish the so-called independent enterprise standard for attributing profit, but they do not talk about transactions. So there, I think the discussion paper, there is a, a sentence or two in the discussion paper that suggests uh, that Article 9 uh, uh, requires a focus on transactions. That's not the case, and there I, I uh, agree, agree with Paul. That would be a, a real difficulty. If we move to an allocation system, uh, then the treaties can't cope with it because it's not about transactions between different entities. It's about attribution, the, attributing the right level of profit to related entities. <coughs> and that was always the case until the transactional approach was brought into the transfer pricing guidelines really in 1995. <coughs> Other aspects uh, can also be dealt with through existing treaty rules. For example, uh, again, uh, there is a, an issue about uh, uh, taxable presence uh, and the physical definition of permanent establishment. But that problem is made far greater by bringing the independent entity principle quite inappropriately uh, into uh, uh, Article 5, which doesn't, uh, doesn't require that. Uh, so that it's not always a problem of finding uh, a permanent establishment, uh, or even uh, a related company. Very many highly digitalized companies actually do have affiliates in market jurisdictions. The problem is that applying the independent entity approach, you're supposed to treat all those different affiliates uh, on an independent basis, and so you use one-sided methods to attribute profit to, the, to them. 
<coughs> so in our submission on the uh, uh, consultation last year and the year before on attribution of profits to PEs, we already suggested a holistic approach to attribution of profits uh, under Article 5 and Article 7. Uh, equally, in uh, uh, finding taxable presence, uh, already the United Nations model, Article 5.3b, has this expanded definition uh, in terms of services, a services PE, uh, which could go a long way because very many uh, companies today, we talk about digitalization, but the trend has been uh, towards, away from uh, physical products towards uh, services. Even uh, hard physical companies, like auto companies, see themselves much more now as delivering a transportation service uh, to their customers. Um, and in that context, really, the issue of services and the service appeal ought to be looked at much more clearly. Um, <coughs> so, uh, although a change to Article 5 would be desirable uh, mm -hmm. to expand uh, and recognize significant economic presence, um, and I would support a quantitative test combined with other tests, um, um, I would deplore, actually, having to treat uh, relatively small companies. I sympathize with the comments made this morning from small enterprises, innovative enterprises that may have a global market but really are substantially based in one country. Uh, I wouldn't want uh, to find a taxable presence for all of them. Uh, so I think there should be a, a threshold and there should be something more than simply having uh, customers uh, in those jurisdictions. Uh, but already much could be done. And it's important to say because if we are at a turning point, we can't be held back by saying uh, uh, we can't move until everyone agrees on everything and there's a multilateral treaty that signs everything off. That clearly can't be the case. Um, the alternative is all the unilateral measures. Nobody wants the unilateral measures that states are taking, uh, so we need to move forward, and we can't move forward at the pace of the slowest. Much can be done under existing tax treaty rules, is what I'm saying. The other side of it is the transfer pricing guidelines. Now, they, to me, have uh, two aspects. One is the advantages, the advantages of the guidelines. The advantages are that they're flexible. They're only international soft law. They can easily be rewritten. They can, uh, but it needs will, it needs will. And we do now need a new approach, really. We need now to think again. I mean, we've been working on it now. It's the sixth year since the uh, BEPS action plan was, uh, was adopted. Uh, and in, in some of the discussions we've had, usually at the bar after the meetings, uh, delegates have said to me, maybe we should have had a new approach. And now is the time for a new approach to the guidelines. Um, uh, adopting, as I say, moving away from the transactional approach, adopting a single entity approach. Um, and that's the advantage, because the big disadvantage of the guidelines now, for everybody, but particularly, I think, for the revenue authorities, for the tax authorities, uh, for large countries as much as small, but probably especially the small countries, uh, <coughs> is the need for an individual facts and circumstances analysis of not only every taxpayer, but every affiliate. This is an impossible task. That is not a, 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 a recipe uh, for tax certainty. That's a recipe for uncertainty and the conflicts that we have seen. Uh, so we really need to move away from that approach. Um, <coughs> now, that can be done. I'm not saying that means forget everything you ever learned. It can be done by building on existing approaches. The profit split method was already introduced in the 1995 guidelines as a result of a shift towards a more uh, profit-oriented approach, but very little work has ever been done on that. Even in the VETS project, we were hopeful that the work on profit split would come uh, uh, to a better resolution, but it clearly didn't. Clearly, substantial work needs now to be done to systematize an allocation approach, which could build on the profit split method, but much has been said here about the residual profit split. Now, again, looked at from the point of view of simplicity, ease of administration, uh, that's not the way to go. A residual profit split would still require the first step of the impacts and circumstances analysis and use of a one-sided method and so on, which is really unnecessary. The contribution analysis profit split is already in the guidelines and it's perfectly adequate. Provided you have the right allocation factors, they reflect the contribution of the different parties. If you have a distribution entity that really does not have substantial presence, that has low paid employees that are really just loading stuff onto trucks uh, and manning tills at the checkout, then they don't get a big uh, profit allocation. Um, <coughs> the contribution profit split could be built on, but it obviously needs systematizing, it needs a holistic approach, needs to go beyond bilateralism, 
and it also needs work on defining the tax base. There's clearly a lot of work to be done there. Uh, financial uh, accounting standards, consolidated accounts, uh, are not really suitable for tax purposes, but they're a starting point. They are at least there, and companies know what they are. So all of that is to urge that there should be this combination of setting a clear direction of travel and then working cooperatively, constructively, as, as uh, Will said, uh, <coughs> from a bottom-up basis on the hard work of identifying easily quantifiable, clearly administrable uh, methods for allocating the profit. Simplicity, fairness, and predictability. Thank you very much.